story session now. And the basic prompt is for those who feel inspired to come up and share what the Dhamma has meant to you this last year. Uh, your journey, struggles, and inspiration with it, or how you came to the Dhamma, one or the other. And uh, it's just a chance to bring into the open the collected wisdom and um, of this community and to really let it speak. And I find they're meaningful conversations. And once again, if you're a bit on edge about coming up, then just consider it a gift to, for, to others to be able to see. And uh, odds are your journey is something that will resonate deeply with others here too. So if people could be mindful of the number of folks we have in just, you know, five, six, seven minutes, something like that. Maybe five, aiming four, but it's okay if it runs a little long. And um, basically I'll just move aside and someone can come up. Um, and do we have anyone volunteering a Zafu? That is the cushions that people have something to sit on. Zafu donation. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. It's a really nice Zafu, actually. I tried to figure out how to spell Zafu last week. With two Fs, it's a band on Spotify. <laughs> <laughs> One F. <laughs> okay, so I'll move aside, and then those who want can, uh, and yeah, Matt, that, that can come up here, that's great. And please just, anyone who's inspired, come on up. I have to calm down for a minute. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I, I decided to come up here because um, there's a, this, this month at Sims, we're talking about generosity. And um, um, that's really been my practice. Um, and it's a practice that I, I don't like to talk about. I kind of like to hide the fact that that that's kind of how I practice, that that's how I am in the world. Um, and I remember, I just want to go back to the first time I went to Sims, I, I had been practicing it, um, so just how I came into the practice, you know, through suffering like most of us. Um, but I was, I was with MBSR for like a year, and then I came to Sims finally, I think at the end of 2017, and Tuiri was talking, and she was giving a talk on on generosity, and it was it was the end of the year, um, so that she had they had been been doing a, a series on the paramis that year, and I had just gotten home from a trip to Boston to visit my sister, Boston area, um, and I had finished after a very difficult relationship with her after my mother died. Um, that's kind of how I got in the practice, and um, I had just done this whole inventory thing for her new jewelry making business. And I was there for an entire week, and I feel like she, she barely thanked me. You know, I, I, I escaped from a snowstorm to get back home. And so this night, here's Tuari talking about generosity. And I'm, like <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know, I was just doing all this work, and, you know, you know, it just doesn't even feel like it was even received and this and that. And, and Tuari said something about, you know, it's, it's my generosity. It doesn't belong to her. It doesn't belong to anybody. It, it belongs to me. That's it's my heart. It's, it's my generosity. So, fast forward. Um, you know, I started. It's it's just my nature to get involved in stuff. So I started, and I you know I have a background in tech. So I, I started volunteering a lot, and I started volunteering. I was on the regist registrar team, and then helped with the website, and you know did all this. And then I got on the board, and it was right before the pandemic. So I did all this work. I created a new website. I, and I have learned a lot about generosity in these years. Um, 
especially in the past year, and if we go to the past year, and then then I, and now I'm here, and I'm and I and I love volunteering for Clear Mountain as well, and and there's like a there's different energies in the two organizations. Um, they're both beautiful, and so this year I've been doing a, you know practicing mindfulness, right mindfulness, like going back to that, like really in the past just few months, uh, right mindfulness and right view, and. Um, I'm gonna lose my train of thought here. Uh oh. <laughs> um, that sense of, I, I think I lost my train of thought on that, but I think what generosity has taught me, um, well, first of all, it's given me a, a, a huge gift of, ma I have made so many friends, and I have, and I have, I feel like I, I could have, after after I retired and my mother died and you know I got all crazy and you know cast my partner as Parkinson's and I could have got I could have gone into isolation, and I and I chose not to, mostly because it's not my nature. But there it was. I mean here here was all these uh, this opportunity to to practice to, and I wasn't even thinking about it as practice. And I was just you know I'm going to be here. And but I've learned that you know people. That. That the generosities that I know where where my train of thought was that there's the internal and the external mindfulness and the internal and the external view and on all that and 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 my practice is really to 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 recognize when when I'm when I'm when the external has invaded the internal and and my and my mind state goes somewhere where it where it's not even real you know my perceptions are off and. I've learned about taking things personally. I've learned about, you know, I've learned about a lot. And um, anyway, I, I could go on and on, and I and I and I don't want to. And, and really, I have not, not much more to say. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna fall over. <laughs> so thanks for listening. I appreciate you. That was Cheryl, and now we have Aruna, which means dawn. Yes, um, my name is Aruna. Um, I, until about five years ago, I had a regular life, um, a husband and two kids, two girls. Um, I have been trying to get into meditation for a while, and then once uh, I attended a meditation session uh, given by a lady in a, in a library, and then I was kind of expecting something miraculous to happen, and she said, okay, let's chant, and said, okay, everybody close your eyes and sit there for 10 minutes, and then watch your breath. I thought, is it all? Like, is there something more? <laughs> and then <laughs> that was it. It was kind of like a bit disappointing saying, you know, nothing miraculous happened nothing to learn in there. <laughs> but I attended for a, a few sessions. Then um, about five years ago, um, my then husband, he didn't want to stay in a marriage anymore, and then he wanted to be out, which was kind of like a shock for me because I didn't see that coming. Um, but in a way, it was easy to let go because I thought, you know, as an adult, he has a choice to do whatever he wants to do. But um, uh, the most painful part was uh, my daughters, who were at the time uh, 16 and 19, uh, they just kind of went away with him. Uh, it, it was all overnight. And then they, after that, they never responded to me, never wanted to have anything with me. And then, you know, um, they don't talk to me. It's been like over five years now. And then, like, overnight, I just lost everything, like the kids, the dog, um, you know, I literally had to move out and I had no, I couldn't make sense of it. I didn't know what was the reason. And then for a year, I kind of lived in a fog, uh, trying to make sense of like, what is it? And all the usual questions of, you know, why me? And why can't I have the regular life like everybody's having? And what did I do wrong and all that? And then all through, I was grasping at straws for a miracle. Like somebody would come and tell me, do one, two, three, and you will get it back. Um, at the time, uh, some friend sent me a link for um, Ajahn Brahm's talks. So I used to listen to the talks, and then all the things I was used to, I used to search for is how to let go. You know, what are the things to let go? How do I kind of like get out of this? Um, after some time, I uh, wanted something more serious than Ajahn Brahm. 
And then I started listening to Ajahn Sona. Um, it, they all gave me a, a path, um, something, you know, answers which I was not, uh, I was not asking the right questions, but the answers were always there. Um, then I made a little contribution to uh, Tibetan Nuns Project, which is here in Seattle. And then Steve Wilhelm, who was the board of directors, um, he called me one day to thank. And then we were just chatting and I said, uh, there is no good place here to go and attend and learn something. And he said, oh, no, no, there is this in Claremont Monastery and you should come and check out and all. Um, it was really um, life changing for me to say, um, I still h struggle with a little bit of anger and resentment and all once in a while that like, why not? Um, but you know, I see this as a, as a huge gift. I had done my job, I had raised my kids. Um, it could have gone a lot more worse, but now I see this period as a gift that they have given to me. I still have my um, health and energy and everything and now they're telling me to do whatever, whatever I want with my life. I wouldn't have gotten this. I would have lived in a bubble of my kids and my, my dog and my home and my husband and all. Now, um, so many people approach me. I teach, I teach, so I see lots of parents approach me w and then they are open to share with the struggles that they have their, with their kids and all. And um, the, the path of Dharma has given me the open heart to listen to them and then say whatever comes out. Um, I don't judge them and I can understand the pain that they're going through. And then I see both sides, what the kids are going through and what the parents are going through too. And then I am, you know, I'm hoping that I know I'm able to help some people. And then more than anything to see, I used to beat myself up for a while saying, why did I have to come to this path through suffering? Why didn't I see this when I was having like a good life? That would have been, you know, much more nicer. <laughs> I was listening to a talk with a Swami and he said, even Buddha didn't come to this path out of good life. He was a prince and he had everything going for him, but only when he saw suffering, that's when he realized this was not an intellectual, um, you know, exploration for, for him <laughs> or anything. So compared to all that, I guess like we are nowhere, but I do see lots of young people here and you know, they come week after week and they're exploring and it's very, very inspiring. Maybe in some life, <laughs> maybe I will realize it much younger than this too. <laughs> but more than anything, to see the Ajans who actually live what they teach, and then it is, it is to see that it's possible. It's not to say like, oh, how can, I, how can I practice? How can I have compassion? How can I have generosity and all? They are doing it. They listen to all these people come and say their sufferings and all, and you know, it is so very inspiring, and I would never have realized all this. Um, um, as just uh, Jan said in this meditation, if coming to this moment, it had taken uh, all the path, it's all absolutely worth it. Thank you. Guru and I first had a longer conversation carrying large logs outside of Servasti Abbey. She can carry very large logs. <laughs> Thank you. Trenton. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Trenton. Um, today is actually my twin and I, our 25th birthday. Um, so I would like to offer a rejoice and goodness in how the Dhamma has appeared for me this year in terms of this community and what it has given me. And I would like to offer, and I would like to dedicate the merit of the following reflection to our parents. Um, so I started coming here earlier this year and I had 
known about Buddhism for quite a while, but um, I would venture to say that there were at least certain points in the past where I thought that I just couldn't do it. I was kind of beyond, maybe, maybe saying beyond hope would be a little dramatic, but kind of just like, I don't know. Um, and I remember early in coming here, I had an experience of feeling like meditation was actually possible for someone like me. Um, so I just kept coming, kept coming to live streams and online events, but I would specifically like to speak to the love that appears through the community here and how that love has um, reached out to me. Um, knowing that there's a community of care here that I can come to um, and to see role models of people embodying forgiveness and love and friendship and joy and all of these things. Um, and that sometimes if all I can do is just show up, at least I showed up, right? Um, because I think um, just being able to come here has been an immense privilege, um, being able to serve, um, being able to make merit. If you told me like two years ago I'd have the opportunity to give food to a monk, I probably would have been like, what? <laughs> you know, but um, yeah, I'd really just like to say um, thank you very much um, to the Clear Mountain community um, and just um, for everything that this place has given to me. Um, and yeah, I'd also um, just like to say in body, speech, or mind, intentional or unintentional, any offense I may have caused to anyone in Zoom or on this room, um, I'd like to ask for forgiveness. And I would also like to say that may we all learn to forgive each other, love each other, forgive ourselves, and love ourselves. Thank you. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Hi everyone. Yeah, um, I'm Grace. Um, not sure what to say really, but I just this place has such a huge place in my heart, and. Um, started coming here a couple of years ago, I think, and um, moved to Seattle um, after a friend did during the pandemic from Michigan. And um, it's just been such a ride to um, be in the Dhamma. And I started meditating during the pandemic, as many people did, I've talked with. And um, I found a meditation teacher that really showed me um, Anicca, Dukkha, and Anatta in a way that really struck me. And um, I think it's, I'm just so grateful for that, uh, to see that um, we're more than who we think we are in these bodies. And there's so much more to um, explore in this path. And um, just been reflecting on how much it doesn't really matter at all what I'm doing in my day. Like as long as I'm doing it with a heart of kindness and, um, and I was hung up so much on my career. I was at a career in tech and uh, really hating my life, actually. Um, suffering is definitely a, a very ripe path um, into doorway into the path, uh, eight, eight, eight noble path. And um, just, just um, yeah, I guess, I think um, the most important thing that I'm grateful for actually in myself is sort of this, um, this drive of curiosity to understand what all this is. And I think it's so important and I see it in all of you too. And um, that's what's gonna get us, um, keep us at, in this straight line of the spiritual path. Uh, and yeah, so I guess just like what I'd like to share is um, I'm learning that, yeah, just trying to step out of the way and um, letting my heart lead and uh, kind of trying to turn off the thinking mind as we try to do in meditation um, 
is just such a beautiful way to live in daily life too. And um, being immersed in whatever we're doing and doing it for the greater good. Um, yeah, just, I guess I offer these reflections of what I've been experiencing. And um, yeah, I, I guess I'll say one more thing, just that I've, um, I've gained so much from visiting monasteries. And uh, I was at monasteries earlier this spring uh, very grateful for my time at Anakampa in the UK and um, spent seven weeks there as a steward and I'm going off to visit a couple monasteries in the Bay Area and then um, Canmore Buddhist Society in the winter retreat and I'm just so grateful for um, for all the things that have happened like I haven't asked for any of it it's uh, it's not my doing it's just um, kama playing out and I'm very grateful for whatever I may have done in past lives to be in this place where I am right now. And um, though I don't know the future, I know that um, I'm taking every step with um, great reverence and respect for this life and um, being here with all of you. So thank you for listening. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. For those on Zoom, there was a gigantic thunder blast right when Grace ended, which was very dramatic. <laughs> Jeremy. Hello, everybody. My name is Jeremy, and uh, yeah, suffering is what got me started down this path for sure. There's like, when you're suffering enough, there's, there becomes a willingness to open up your mind to different possibilities. And so, yeah, in hindsight, I can say I feel grateful for that. That happened at a relatively young age for me during my teenage years as a lot of suffering and uh, opened me up to exploring spiritual options and and I'd also always had a curiosity about spirituality but I didn't really like embrace it until I was suffering enough to to really get into it so I meditated for the first time and uh, it was, and it felt good and I, I, I had a sense of like confidence about this like oh wow this is something I can do it feels good and also like a curiosity to learn more about it and uh, and this is, uh, I'm thinking of framing my experience in this way because of a, a, one of my favorite talks by Ajahn Suchitto talking about how like it feels good and you can do it. <laughs> and uh, and that's, that's pretty much, I think, a really nice way to sum up my path so far is like my first time I meditated, I just scratched the surface, but it felt good. And so there was a curiosity to learn more and, uh, and to keep going deeper. And so, yeah, I went on a meditation retreat and, uh, and then, you know, became interested in Buddhism. And then at some point I visited a monastery and then that was a really big uh, shift for me because I, it felt like I was in a, like a parallel reality of all these people that are like exhibiting all these wholesome qualities and they're like at their best and, and I'm able to, like the best in me is able to come out. And so, and then once I left the monastery, then I, uh, after, you know, a week long visit, I started seeking out groups closer to home, like this one, where it's like people come together and, and, uh, and really try to cultivate these wholesome qualities and, and, and it's so inspiring and uh, like such a relief to be around people who are, uh, have all this metta, as somebody else mentioned. So yeah, it feels very nourishing to, to have a, a community to sort of help me bring out the best in myself and, and I hope that I'm able to do that for everyone else as well. And then in terms of progress, it's, it's not always easy to see it on the short term, but if you look back over it, like a period of several years, I can see there's a huge difference in, in like say over five years between where I started and, uh, and what I've been able to cultivate by following the guidance of wise friends. So yeah, thank you all for being here to help me in that. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a pleasure and uh, I'm very grateful. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.
night. Kristen. <laughs> Say why not, because I, it was a little eerie. We were picking up Ajahn Nisabo at the ferry today, and I said to my husband in the car that I, I had a dream last night that Ajahn Nisabo was going to ask members of the community to speak about what they've been learning. <laughs> so it's a little weird. <laughs> um, I feel like that's a sign. Um, so I've, uh, what brought me here, I've been skirting around Buddhism for quite some time. I was raised in a very spiritual family and was a comparative religion major when I started undergrad and recently found some letters I had written to a friend. Um, she returned them to me and it was talking about Buddhism and I think I was about 22 years old, 47 now. Um, but what brought me was suffering <laughs> and I think it was about 12 years ago, I, I was fortunate to have a Buddhist therapist who helped me learn how to meditate. And it was so powerful that this pain that I had been holding onto for so long that I was able to, in moments, let it go. And it wasn't that long after that that I had the fortune of meeting my amazing partner who was practicing. And, but still, you know, I'd gone to Sims and it wasn't clicking for me. Um, I, I, you know, Tawari married us. So, I mean, I was very invested, but I didn't feel like I was learning and that I needed more structure um, and more of a, a formal path. And so I've been coming to Clear Mountain, I would say probably less than a year at this point. Um, and it's really inspired me to take a more formal and learned approach to Buddhism. And what it's unlocked for me, and, and particularly like studying the Eightfold Path, is it's g given me permission to change my life for the better. And I would say it had a m major impact on me leaving my career, I don't know where Grace is, in tech. <laughs> and um, seeing myself and, and the wrong speech and the wrong action and having a vocation that while perhaps beneficial to some, wasn't really beneficial to the most people around me. And um, it's just changed my life uh, really in subtle ways and major ways. And I would say that I'm inspired by all of you to continue down this path. I am very lucky that I have a supportive partner who I look up to quite a bit um, in this way. Um, what else do I wanna say? I don't know. Um, there's such peace and beauty in this community and I feel reconnected with a sense of depth in myself that I long had thought was gone. Um, and there's a hopefulness in that and a brightness to my life now that I really, really lost touch with. And that's my hope for everyone here, is that this brings that brightness to your life and that we can share in that together because it's such a beautiful thing. Um, yeah, that's, I think that's it. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So I probably started coming about, I think it was April this year. Um, I randomly saw a sign on a telephone pole, so I think I've told some people before. Um, and uh, yeah, let's see, I, had, I, I mean, I, I had spirit. I was, I was like very spiritual when I was like really, really little. Like, but I was kind of raised in a Catholic family, and um, I. But I, I lost touch with that really early on, and um, I was just kind of out floating for a long time. But yeah, I had like 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 some of us here. Like I had a lot of um, suffering as a teenager, kind of 
led me seeking answers. And um, I found uh, Ajahn Brahm, who um, I think has been kind of the gateway Dhamma for a lot of people in this community. Um, he's great. Um, and uh, I found like uh, Tara Brock, who um, if anyone's not as lucky as, um, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, but um, yeah, oh, Kristen, um, to, to have a um, Buddhist uh, therapist, uh, she's a great stand-in. Um, but uh, yeah, um, then like it was funny because like almost five years ago, I was like kind of figured out what meditation was and it was like that is absolutely something that it was like that would be perfect for me i should start doing this and it was very hard there was like a lot of emotional blockage there but um it's been kind of a process and then you know i i mean i you know i'd read a book about like buddhism before i came here and i was like oh you know the sangha it's probably like important and stuff but actually being a part of this group and kind of getting to know some people and has kind of made me realize it's like wow that really does have like a, a big effect like I recently went to Sims and I took their introduction course and my meditation practice just really started taking off all of a sudden and uh, yeah it's, it's it's been a trip <laughs> thanks everyone <laughs>
man in my life after being a widow for some years. And um, we both work full time and we get together and we're, you know, our minds are just going yada, yada, yada. And so we try to get out of the mind and more into just being present and have used intoxicants. So the other day when he was over, I said, I'd like to offer a guided meditation for us to get out of our heads and into presence. And he was willing to do it. He doesn't have a practice. And um, it was amazing. Um, I don't know, that doesn't mean that I'm never gonna use intoxicants again. I still am, I'm still in this practice. I don't know, but um, um, several months ago, there was a monk who came here and he said, um, someone asked him, what is the most important thing you learned in 17 years in robes? And he said, it was being totally honest with himself. And that's what I think I've been given as this gift of um, Tim and Tawari saying, okay, you can share the Dhamma. And it has meant that I've had to be so brutally honest with myself. What do I, how do I really live it? And um, I'm really grateful. And Thank you for the opportunity for me to do my little confession here. I was thinking, do I, am I gonna tell anybody about this? You know, well, so here I am, having done it. Thank you. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Uh, those on Zoom can also raise their hand to share if they'd like. And I think a good takeaway is the next time you're at a party and someone wants to drink together, you can just offer a guided meditation. <laughs> Get Sue's on board, yes. But we have room for people in the auditorium as well. Please. Hello. So uh, I'm Miles, for those who I haven't met yet. Um, been coming here for a while now, but uh, as some of you know, kind of on and off, because I tend to run away to the monasteries and meditation centers and stuff, which uh, I'll be doing again pretty soon here on Wednesday. Um, yeah, yeah, this coming Wednesday, and I'll probably be gone for minimum 13 months if all goes according to plan, but maybe longer. Um, I might get a two-week break in there somewhere, so maybe I'll poke my head back in once or twice, but yeah, um, this community, you know, has just been an incredible home for me in my spiritual practice. Uh, I think I've mentioned this before, um, both in front of everyone and to many people individually, but uh, yeah, my I, I was just, you know, living, uh, well, a very non-Domic life before coming in contact with Clear Mountain. And it really is solely because of this community and, you know, the example set by the Ajans as well that, um, that I really have any practice at all right now. Um, so, yeah, Anumotana for that. And... Um, on top of that, there's been, you know, friends that I've made in the community where we'll we'll meet outside of of these Saturday gatherings and listen to Dhamma talks and meditate together, and then also just you know talk with each other and um, share what's going on in our lives. Um, and that's been incredibly beneficial. I mean, you know, it's one thing to come here every Saturday and um, get amazing guidance from people who actually know what they're doing <laughs> um, and, and engage with other sincere practitioners and you know, just people who, I mean, it's, it's just such a bright community. I haven't come in contact with any other 
uh, Buddhist communities that really have the, the levity that Clear Mountain has. And that's, yeah, really special. But yeah, so I, I, we, some of us meet up for Dhamma talks and meditation and whatnot. And, and that is something that I want to impress upon people is very valuable. You know, if you have a place where you can uh, offer a space for a smaller group to meditate together and meet up and hang out, um, it's really, it, I mean, I'm sure you just know intuitively how powerful it could be for your practice, but um, it, it'll probably still surprise you in how powerful it can be. So, um, you know, in how it really forges a deeper bond with uh, other practitioners. And so, um, yeah, I kind of have an agenda here. I'm like, you guys, <laughs> start meeting up more outside. And I know some people do, you know, um, other than the, the few of us that, that meet up outside um, that, that I know of. I know I have heard of other people meeting up outside. But, yeah, I think it's, it's just um, really special. And <clears throat> I'm trying to think of... Uh, anything else. I mean, I have been around the world and back since I engaged with a lot of you. You know, I, uh, I went to Asia and then I came back in June and now I've been here for, what is it, like a little over five months. And so um, now I'm about to go back out. And there is one significant learning that I've had from that and you know a lot of this running around for many of us even if we know intellectually we're not going to find you know some great guru who can show us the way and then we're just set on the path even though we intellectually know that and even though I intellectually know that you know there is still that hope like oh but maybe you know maybe I'll find somebody who can just kind of have the the perfectly shaped key to unlock my mind and uh yeah, one of the things that I've come to is just like, oh, no, like, <laughs> that's a that's just a fantasy, you know, and if it happens, amazing, you know, that's wonderful, but, like, I really just have to take my practice into my own hands and um, take full responsibility for my practice, and then if I find a, a, a great teacher um, that, that, you know, resonates, there are great teachers, but just, you know, uh, I wouldn't say there's been one where I'm like, Ah, oh, this is it. You know, I'm 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 just gonna be this person's disciple, and and that's it. Um, yeah, I've just realized like I really got to take take this into my own hands. And um, succeeding and failing in various ways in that regard. So there's a lot that I could say. I mean, like somebody read my mind in Thailand, incontrovertibly. It's undeniable. It happened. The, the way that it happened, it's very logical, where I'm like, it's the only option, he read my mind. You know, so it's like stuff like that, it's cool, it's real, it's out there. Um, but I still tell, would encourage you guys, don't take my word for it. You know, don't believe me until you actually have an experience like that. Um, you know, so there, there, there's cool stuff like that, but a lot of it really is also just like, um, e e even though you know, that person read my mind, I was like, but do you know the Dhamma? <laughs> so, so for me, that, that's kind of the name of the game and um, something that I need to continue working on. And yeah, I'll be at Insight Retreat Center, hopefully, fingers crossed, if all goes well. And so if anyone uh, takes a retreat there between, you know, December of this year and December of next year, maybe I'll be there. Um, unless I, you know, anger the gods of Insight Retreat Center, and they say, and they say no. So, um, thanks for listening to my monologue. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.
Okay. So the task of everyone after this is to circle around miles and get the story of the mind reading. <laughs> but um, good luck, Miles, really. And uh, what Miles is saying around meeting up outside of these gatherings is, is really important. Um, we have a Mitta Meetups page on the website where people can sign up for the calendar and sort of put gatherings, host one at your house. And uh, that really is a sign of the strengthening of this community is when people begin to make these bonds and um, outside of the actual Saturdays. And the Buddha uh, emphasized six objects of reverence, Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, heedfulness, the training, and the sixth is receiving guests or hospitality. So really, that's, that's key in this community. I know I had a monk friend who lived in Japan for a while, and he said that that quality of hospitality was just held so sacred that if you went to someone's house for dinner and sort of said some admiring comment about a painting on the wall, there was a good 50% chance they would just hand it to you. And can we really cultivate that kind of sanctity around hospitality? Can you make it a practice once a month at least to kind of bring people into your house, just cook for them, open it up to this community and, and others, and, and really consider that as important as your meditation? It's, it's, you do not come in contact with people this beautiful every day, so make much of it. And thank you everyone for those who, who shared uh, their stories. It's, it's genuinely meaningful.